Welcome everyone, we are at the midpoint of the F1 2024 season and at the start of the year I laid out my predictions. Some were bold, some were realistic and uh, I think some were just plain out stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, let's have an update of where those predictions currently lie as we've hit the halfway point of the season or beyond that actually as we have only 10 races remaining of the 2024 season. I'm thoroughly enjoying it a lot more than I initially predicted at the start. Um, so yeah, let's see where we've got things right and where we've got things no doubt terribly wrong. So guys, just a quick little disclaimer here, but before we get into these predictions, um, Oli Berman is currently P14 in the standings with six points. Um, a great drive that he had in Saudi Arabia, of course, stepping in for Carlos Sainz when he had to have his appendix removed. Um, so yeah, great drive from him. He's currently P14. And for the basis of these predictions, which I could not predict that that was going to happen, unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball. Otherwise, I'd be a, a very rich man, guys, which... So bit i'm currently not but <laughs> to anyone who is below him for this prediction basis um i'm promoting them up a position so where they are in their current standings uh, which we'll detail uh, throughout the course of this video promote them up one position and that is realistically where they are um if you remove ollie Behrman. so yeah um just wanted to let you guys know that so let's go so let's start with Zhou Guanyu and 20th place I predicted him to be in and well I'm not far off he is nearly languishing at the back he's joint with two other drivers on Nilpois and well I think it's only due to count back um, I believe with some higher place finishes um, in the lower half of the um, grid but he is above the two other drivers who are on zero points as well. Um, so I'm not far off there. Um, I will equally see them all as being pretty much on zero points. I know it's tough to score points now these days, uh, but it's not been a good half of the first half of the season for Joe Guan Yu. Uh, the last two years, I wouldn't say he's ever done anything spectacular. He's just kind of plodded along uh, Alfa Romeo. Um, the former, obviously, guys of stake F1, um, however they like to be referred to now, I don't know. Kick Salba team, yeah. But he kind of just went about his business, got caught up, in, caught up in some unfortunate incidents with no fault of his own, some mechanical failures. But yeah, he's never really done anything that's wow, but he's done more than, say, Logan Sargent. And this year, though, it's been very poor now he is in a poor car that is for, for definite and look the team have really struggled with um, their pit stops and just lost so much time for both of their drivers in their races but he's being consistently outperformed by Valtteri Bottas in qualifying and on race weekends uh, I think Valtteri Bottas has had the unfortunate um been on the yeah the end of more unfortunate pit stops uh, dnfs and uh, just yeah um issues with with the car compared to joan but yeah he hasn't done anything he's really struggled this year he's been way off the pace at a lot of circuits in qualifying and, and over the race uh, distance compared to his teammate but i do think he's going to stay on the grid <laughs> um purely because like sergio perez there is a massive market for F1 in China. There's one Chinese Grand Prix. It's a massive country. And this lad is a superstar there. If anyone watched any of the footage from the weekend at China, our first time we went back to China in a few years, I think it was pre-COVID, um, and he was treated like a superstar. He had his own documentary being filmed. He had private security. Um, he had, at the end of the race, the, the grid positions or the top three positions um which are of course kept for the podium he had his own one out on track with his face on it like a placard it was just like wow absolute adoration for him he brings in a shit lot of money for f1 in the fact of support for him at that race weekend and sponsors as well the rumors are figures branded around of uh, 
he's worth 30 million that he brings to F1, which is crazy. And that is a crazy amount of money for any team to turn down, um, even um, lucrative teams and successful teams like Red Bull, like Mercedes, like Aston Martin and, and so forth for McLaren and, and Ferrari. Um, but he's not gonna drive for those. I think he's going to be retained at stake because we know there's still a seat to be confirmed alongside Nico Hülkenberg, um, and that's before they officially become Audi F1 in 2026. So, yeah, I don't see too much improvement from him or the team over the remainder of this season. Um, and, yeah, I, I still expect, though, to see him on the grid next year because of, uh, yeah, that cash that he brings and because of the chinese market so yeah but i'm gonna i'm gonna take that as as a i've got that prediction correct because he is on zero points um and it's only due to some lucky count back i think uh positions and finishes that he is uh, ahead of the two other drivers who are on nil point so yeah show Guan you in 20th i think we got that spot on let's go to the next one no surprise here guys eh no surprise here. You probably were like, oh, Sergeant isn't last. <laughs> He's nearly there. He's nearly there. And well, we have this one spot on, even with countback, because with the removal of Ollie Behrman, Logan Sargent is currently in 20th with Behrman in the standings. But if we remove Behrman, because we never considered that he would even be racing this year, as we mentioned at the start, he moves up a position into 19. So this is spot on, guys. And well, he was either gonna he was gonna be at the bottom some way, wasn't he? Which is a shame for Logan, Logan and Logie Bear fans, because look, I think a lot of us were shocked that Williams retained him for this year after the poor year he had last uh last time around in 23. And look. I get it was only his first year in F1, but there normally you see sparks from drivers uh, when sparks that can be like, I can justify him being held on to that seat. I can justify, like he has something about him. Yuki Tsunoda, like I've been a critic of Yuki for quite some time and he has been fortunate that he's been given so much time to develop. Um, but I could see what people saw in him in the fact of that, yeah, he is quick. Yeah, there's, there's something about him. He can make some good overtakes. He just needs to rein it in in regards to those mistakes, those spins, those crashes, throwing away good race uh, results. And um, on the contrary, I haven't seen anything from that in Logan Sargent in the year and a half that he's been in F1. Now, people will uh, defend Logan and say he hasn't had the same car. Uh, of course, he had to step out of a race uh, in Australia. So he's actually run one less race than uh, everyone else on the grid, barring Carlos Sainz, who had that appendix surgery. Um, so, but the thing is, and I said it at the time, yeah, while it's harsh, ultimately, there's nothing that Logan Sargent can do to stand there and justify his position um, or his side of the argument that he should be racing in Australia to get them points and it shouldn't be Alex Albon um, if he had not been out qualified so dramatically by Alex Albon uh, over the course of his time in F1 and he actually had scored a few points here and there as well and put in those performances then I think they would have given him that opportunity but he hasn't and he's only got himself to blame and that's why he was left out when that um, unacceptable decision arose. That was Williams' fault, of course. Uh, but yeah, still, he's out of F1, isn't he? Next year, pretty much. Uh, Williams confirms he is off um, and out of Williams, of course, with uh, Carlos Sainz on his way in next year. What a driver pairing that is going to be, by the way, Sainz and Albon. Uh, but yeah, I don't see this man in F1 again. Um, he'll probably go IndyCar or IMSA, something like that. But prediction, spot on, and I'm sure a lot of you won't be surprised that that is where we placed him, or be surprised that that's where he currently is in the standings. Next up, Kevin Magnussen in 18th. Now, I've got this wrong, guys, with Haas in general. We'll get to Nico Hulkenberg shortly, but I thought Haas are really going to struggle this year. Um, they struggled towards the end of last year, and look, Gunther Steiner 
while I did think that was going to be a positive effect with Steiner on his way out of the team, um, I didn't think it'd have that big of an immediate impact uh, in how they operated and um, I didn't expect Haas to have as decent a, a car as they've had this year in the midfield um, they are only I mean we'll get to it but uh, one of their drivers of course Nico Hulkenberg is is quite high up in the standings at the moment you would arguably say he's been the standout in the midfield um, this season um, thus far and Magnussen well I rate Hulkenberg better, uh, higher than Magnussen, and I just thought that I had a feeling this would probably be Magnussen's last year in F1 anyway at the start. Um, and yeah, I just thought it was primarily that the team were going to struggle and provide a car, uh, not provide a car that was was good enough for Magnussen and Hulkenberg to, to drag themselves up fighting the Aston Martins, the Alpines. Um, you know, uh, that, at the circuits where we see the odds, Williams' dominant performance and that. But how wrong I've been. And uh, yeah, Magnussen is in 18th while he's actually in 15th at the moment. So yeah, for, for Kevin, only scored a few points though compared to his teammate. And he's had his struggles, hasn't he? He's still only three points or one big incident away as he's fought from losing his super... Well, getting a race ban on his super license. Um, he's taken out his teammate in Monaco. He, of course, got caught up in that crash with Logan Sargent, uh, which was for 17th position. While I don't think it was Magnussen's fault, it was still for 17th position, so it was for no points whatsoever. Um, but he's provided us with some entertainment this season. <laughs> so on the entertainment factor, he'd be a lot higher. But uh, yeah, for this season, performance-wise, not been great for him. And I don't think we're going to see him um, in another F1 team uh, next year. There's only like two seats that are yet to be confirmed as I record this, which is Stake F1 and Alpine. And yeah, I think this man's going to go back to sports cars, the World Endurance Championship, IMSA, which he was racing in when he had that mini break, didn't he, in, uh, from last time leaving Haas to then returning. So, yeah, a bit off of that one, but I don't think we were too far off because of, um, I don't think anyone really expected Haas to be as strong in this first half of the season as they have been. In 17th, I predicted Valtteri Bottas. And this is the third driver in the current standings halfway through this season who is on Nilpois. Zero points alongside Logan Sargent and his teammate Joe Guan Yu. And well, Valtteri Bottas, due to countback, is at the bottom of the standings out of everyone, which is not indicative of how this man has driven in the first half of the season. We know that stake F1 car is horrendous. I have heard it on another podcast be named as the Green Wheelie Bin. Um, that is how slow and trash it is and Valtteri Bottas has put in some great qualifying performances he has put in some great drives which then just haven't been converted primarily due to the unbelievably slow pit stops at the start of the season by stake f1 then the strategy has been horrendous and particularly last time out at spa Valtteri was running ninth I believe it was uh, maybe 10th but he was he was on for points and we saw the one stop work uh, and be the preferable um, stop in the end barring of course the disqualification with George but the Aston Martins both made it work and uh, someone else further down as well um, I think it was Magnussen and because of how difficult it was to overtake and with a few laps remaining they decided to pit Valtteri Bottas um, now I'm not sure if it was because of maybe the same concerns that they had with what eventually happened with George Russell being underweight but there's been no explanation to that and it seemed very very unfortunate that why would you not leave him out there to at least try and eke out his tires uh, to stay with him weight uh, to get a point sneak a point two points maybe and they just gave it up pitted him and he came out uh down in 13th or something and, and and just had no chance of even attempting to score points so he's also had some unfortunate dnfs going well in china um uh, potential points on on offer for him there when the safety uh, which brought out the safety car so really unfortunate for valtteri bottas and do you know what's a shame is that this could be his last season in F1 ever. 
that could be a real shame because I do think, as already mentioned, Zhou Guan Yu is going to be retained by Stake F1 purely because of the money that he brings in. Uh, and I think there may be outside influences who, who want Zhou Guan Yu to stay in F1. Um, and yeah, for Valtteri, now that Williams seat, which he was highly, highly rumored to be going into, has been taken by Carlos Sainz. I think he's he's gone. I think he's gone. And look, it wasn't too long ago that this man was a race winner with Mercedes. Um, and yeah, t trying to take it to Lewis Hamilton. And, and now look at him. He's at the back of the grid. Um, not got any points. And yeah, it's a real, real shame. But he is not driving like a man who is bottom of the standings. Uh, so yeah, that's how sometimes these standings can be a bit, a bit skewed really because they're not always indicative of how uh drivers have actually been performing so i predicted him to be as low as he was not because of valtteri the driver but because of the team and the car and look we've been proved right on that so yeah wasn't far off but i don't think anyone really expected valtteri bottas would be at the bottom of the standings halfway or at the midpoint of this season this is probably the one that i've got completely wrong here guys of course we've touched on magnuson already but it wasn't that far off the mark but this one definitely is nico holkenberg i predicted would be 16th for reasons we've discussed already about haas not the driver but because of the team and because i didn't think that car was going to be very good oh how wrong i have been because nico holkenberg is currently sitting in p11 on 22 points he is behind the top 10 where, where those positions are currently held by the top five teams who you'd expect to be in the top 10 and he's only two points away from that top 10 as well we'll get to obviously who is in that 10th position and who he's who he's close to but wow what a first half of the season for nico hulkenberg we now know that he's on his way to audi which look that is currently stake f1 and he's moving to their next season which is before they become audi I, could it be a step back i think it could be i think cars are going to be an interesting team to watch over the coming se uh, coming years and the rest of this season because Haas have a bit of a track record of hanging off on the second half of a season as uh, other teams ply more into development and, the, and they kind of the development race other teams are better at it than Haas. Um, but look, they've got a good car off the bat. Nico Hulkenberg has done wonders. Those that those couple of races in that swing of Austria and Barcelona, uh, I think it was, where he finished like in the top six, top eight, was just great driving from, from Nico Hulkenberg. Unbelievable. And yeah, um, I have to apologize to this man because last season when he was brought back into the team, I thought it was very, a very uninspiring move to bring him back. I would have liked to have seen alongside Magnussen, who's the elder statesman and the more experienced driver, to have a, a, a younger driver, a junior driver, like we're going to see next year with Esteban Ocon and, and Oli Behrman. But wow, he has just completely wiped the floor of Kevin Magnussen. He's been great in qualifying, um, consistently getting it into Q3. And then in the race where you expect them to drop back, he just hasn't been. And that's a credit to the team and a credit to this man as well. So, yeah, uh, intrigued to see and excited to see how he gets on for the remainder of the season. Can he finish in that top 10 of the driver standings? What an achievement that would be. And I think there's a good opportunity that he can, particularly because he's only a couple of points behind a certain driver in p10 who i think he can catch and overtake so yeah um got that one wrong entirely and yeah i, I apologize to you Haas fans but pleasantly surprised to see him up in 11th and uh yeah let's see what he can do in the second half of the season alex albon albono in 15th now i've actually placed albono higher than where he currently is um now of course we know albono for the last year and a half has been carrying that Williams team on his back because um, Logan Sargent has done like nothing, nothing to even help 
Alex Albon whatsoever in regards to providing support of being a blocker or like Williams being able to implement Sargent um, via strategy. Uh, Albon's just completely outperformed him in, in all aspects, qualifying it and in the race. And um, I thought he would do a bit better because Williams would have a bit of a better car than they've had um, in the first half of this season. Because one, I didn't expect them to be anywhere near Aston Martin or the Alpines. I did think that they were going to be pushing for more points in more races than what we've seen. Um, now, Albon has missed out on a couple of points in a few races by finishing 11th, but we haven't, we yet to see that that performance from Williams where they are just super quick at a specific track. We haven't seen that yet. Um, whereas we saw that a few times last season, particularly Zanville, where we head to next time out after the summer break. Um, but at the moment, Alex Albon is currently uh, removing Oli Behrman from the equation. He is currently in 17th position on four points. So he is the driver who is just above that bottom three who are on zero points um so yeah i mean alex albon i think he's just doing wonders at the moment uh, i don't think other than really australia where he took too much risk in that practice session uh, that was a very poor mistake from him especially when they knew uh, and he most definitely knew they had one chassis that weekend or one brand new chassis so um or, or no replacements sorry uh that was just a very very poor decision making from him um and i'll I, he's very fortunate that of course logan Sargent has been so poor that he was able to be given logan Sargent's chassis um so obviously caused a big hoo-ha but when you've been quite evidently the dominant team a dominant driver in that team miles ahead of your teammate and the only opportunity for you to score points or your team to score points um i can see why that decision was made but next year line up again alongside carla science could be really intriguing what a driver pairing arguably the strongest in the midfield uh for next year so we're going to see a proper benchmark for alex albon uh, because logan Sargent has been someone that we cannot compare against um even if Logan Sargent fans are saying they didn't have the same car and so forth, I don't care. You haven't warranted having the same car, you know? Like, if you was the better driver, um, you would probably get... You would get fairer treatment, but uh, that's why Alex Albon has been getting the, the preferential treatment, as we say. Uh, so, yeah, not really too much to say about him. Let's see if Williams can pick up the pace in the second half of the season. How much have they actually put forward to um, their development for the second half of the season or are they more focusing on the next year already but yeah 15th I don't think was too wide of the mark it's just Haas that have kind of has displaced that really and he's um, he's a couple of positions I put him a couple of positions ahead of where he currently is this one may shock a few people 14th Yuki Sonoda I know I know I I don't know what was going through my head really in putting Yuki in 14th. Um, I thought the Alpines, which we'll get too soon. I just thought there was a lot of hype around RB um, going to be this car that is is, is they're going to get the they're basically going to be the Red Bull car of last year. They changed their name. They're supposedly going to have the same parts that what Red Bull had last year, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I just thought because of that. The, the two drivers, the two RB drivers are going to finish lower than I think we're all predicting. Um, and I thought Daniel Ricciardo actually was going to have a really strong year. I really did. And I think he was going to outperform his teammate and some other drivers. And how wrong I have been. Because Yuki Tsunoda, while I had him in 14th, um, he is currently in 12th. Now, that is only two positions ahead. Uh, but we know how tight he is in the bottom half. Uh, I think the top 10... Normally, with the state of F1 at the moment, you know the top five teams are pretty much going to be in that top 10. So it's obviously the bottom half is, is a bit more skew if, especially with the limited amount of points that are on offer. Um, but I've been wrong about Yuki. Uh, I thought I was right after the first race. Uh, of course, the, the heated moment where he sent it on Daniel Ricciardo on the cooldown lap to display his anger, which was just completely wrong. 
um, and way over the mark by any uh, by uh, every mean possible. Um, and he's been given, he's obviously been read the riot act <laughs> and he has responded to that and he's really grown up this year. Um, I've really liked his comments in regards to, uh, of course, that place in the second seat alongside Max Verstappen, which we now know is being retained by Perez, but just the way that he's answered those questions and the way he's handed himself out on circuit, he's definitely made a case for himself to, to be in a better team. Um, I don't think, unfortunately, he'll ever be in that Red Bull team, but he should be in a better car than this. And uh, I've been a staunch critic of Yuki over the years. I think he has been very fortunate that he's been retained uh, by RB for so long, out formerly Alpha Tauri. Uh, but it just shows that he is, he has steadily improved. And this year, I think we've seen, we've seen a driver that um, might be quite close to to the finish article uh, and ready for a uh, a top team i think that's literally all we need to see from yuki now is in a faster car his tire management has been very good his pace has been very good um unfortunately for him and like daniel ricardo he's in a team that is probably the worst on the grid in regards to strategy they've thrown so many points away by poor strategies um it's been unreliable i think um yuki's had two dnfs um through no fault of his own of course spa might as well have been a dnf because he had a 60 place grid penalty in that race um so he could have scored a lot more points and be in that top 10 at the moment still two points like nico hulkenberg off of the p10 position and that's on the cards for him in the second half of this season if he can continue the form that he's on and if that team buck their ideas up in regards to reliability and strategy calls. Um, so yeah, got that one wrong and uh, I hope Yuki finishes in the top 10 and basically just um, sticks two fingers up to everyone who has overlooked him for that second Red Bull seat. Lance Stroll in P13. Well, I've got this wrong. I've got this wrong. Now, I thought Lance Stroll was going to be um, struggling this year. And I think he has. The start of the year, he definitely struggled. The moment when he crashed under the safety car in China is a moment that I think will just go down in history of Lance Stroll's career. Um, of course, he's he's been in F1 for eight years now. It's, it's confirmed he's going to be in Aston Martin again next year shock horror <laughs> and um he, i thought he was going to be struggling and be quite comfortably in the bottom half of the table however uh while aston martin hasn't been anywhere near the pace of what it was at the start of last year um and nowhere near podium pos position finishes struggling to even get into q3 um he's he's done a lot better now i still think a I still think he's uh, he's underperformed, and I still think he's very lucky to be an F1, obviously because of his circumstances. Um, but he has stepped up and had better results than Fernando Alonso, which has kind of gone under the radar quite a bit uh, in regards to uh, any criticism of Fernando Alonso, who we'll get to soon. But yeah, he's currently that driver sitting in P10. Um, but to say that, of course, he's he's been performing a bit better of recent and out qualifying his teammate Alonso and finishing ahead, it hasn't been for many points. Um, Lance Stroll is on 24 points and he is currently 25 points behind his teammate, um, which is a lot. That's a whole race win that Fernando Alonso is ahead of Lance Stroll. Um, and there is still, still a possibility that Lance Stroll will finish 13th uh, come the end of the season with Yuki Tsunoda and Nico Hulkenberg uh, only two points behind him um, so yeah we will see we will see but um, yeah I don't think there's really much else to say about Lance Stroll uh, to be honest with you he kind of just goes in he has little peaks but then he drops off again doesn't he and that the Aston Martin also isn't a car at the moment that is uh, near the pace of the top four teams uh, like they were at the start of last season. So, uh, yeah, Lance Stroll, 13th, currently in P10. P12, I had Esteban Ocon, and boy, oh boy, how wrong have I and no doubt many others been about the Alpine team this year. Wow. 
Um, I didn't expect them to do particularly well. I thought they'd be that team just behind the top five of Aston Martin and McLaren, etc., who we've mentioned. Um, but they have had... The, the team's a mess. Just an absolute mess. I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I don't think Alpine's going to be even known as Alpine by the end of this year. It really wouldn't surprise me. Rumours that they're going, or very, very strong rumours uh, that they're going to be using uh, Mercedes engines and Mercedes gearboxes and parts from next year. So that means they're no longer a works team. I think Renault, they've brought Flavio Boratori in to basically asset strip the company. Um, so Renault want out of F1, I think. They just want out. Um, and yeah, uh, that has meant that they've just made a very poor car. Both Esteban Ocon and Pierre Gasly suffered at the start of this season with their car being severely overweight, slow. Nothing that the two drivers, and I think good drivers, like Esteban Ocon and, and Pierre Gasly could do. And um, they had a bit of a mini resurgence in the... Um, mid part of this mid season, shall we say, uh, around Monaco uh, and the, those few races afterwards where they scored points. But then Gasly's engine has just started to go pop all the time. Esteban Ocon, of course, um, on his way out and the team not happy with him, uh, of course, with the crash at Monaco. And he was lucky to get out and score. He scored some good points actually in Spa, but lucky to get out uh, after missing the whole of FP1 there. So yeah, uh, basically Ocon is uh, only on five points, uh, one place ahead of Albon in, uh, if we remove Oli Berman, in 16th. And yeah, I don't see it getting much better for Alpine, really. But Esteban Ocon doesn't care. He's got his seat secured for next year uh, in regards to Haas. Uh, maybe we'll see some Hail Marys from Ocon um, for the remainder of this season. We saw some great overtakes at Spa. And that um, if sometimes if you're... If you're in a team that you know for the, the long term, you maybe might not have gone for those moves, but because he's on the way out, um, it's kind of like, yeah, why not, eh? Why not? But I think a lot of us would have expected Alpine to be a bit higher, um, but yeah, not as low as where they currently are at the moment. So yeah, Ocon in 12th. And swiftly following Pierre Gasly in 11th. Um, as we mentioned about Alpine, most of it has been because of the performance of the car. Of course, had a very poor run of not even starting the race at Silverstone. He got, uh, obviously, uh, penalties at Hungary as well. And it's just been a, a dreadful end to the mid part of this season for Pierre Gasly. And I think he's driven quite well. I think he has. Uh, but both of those drivers, there's not really too much you can say about them when you've been in such an underperforming car. Um, so he scored those points at Monaco and that little run of of points finishes uh three races in a row uh, around there uh in kind of like that triple header apart from silverstone um but yeah uh who knows what the rest of this season has for, for uh, gasly he is two points uh or one point sorry ahead of um esteban ocon at the moment in p15 or p14 without um ollie behrman so three positions away from uh, my prediction but yeah, two two drivers there and a team that I got completely wrong. And it'd be interesting to see uh, the goings on of Alpine for the remainder of this season. Because yeah, I don't see it being that team at the end. They're, they're replacing personnel more time than I've had hot dinners. <laughs> now this is one that yes, I've got very wrong guys. P10, I had Daniel Ricciardo. I just had a vibe at the start of this season that Daniel Ricciardo was just going to just show everyone that he deserves that second seat alongside Sergio Perez. I just thought we were going to see a resurgence of the man um, in that in that junior uh, Red Bull team. And yeah, I've, I've been wrong. Um, he started terribly. The pressure was really on him, wasn't it? Um, I think... Actually, I'll take that back. I don't think he started terribly, but I think his performances weren't amazing. And I think the media 
kind of unfairly jumped on his back because it was an easy news story. Um, I don't think he was doing like, oh wow, like he shouldn't even be in F1 type performances considering who else you've got on the grid at the moment. But um, he has picked up slightly throughout kind of the course of uh, the mid part of this or towards the, the mid end of this season. Um, he is currently on Daniel Ricciardo, uh, 13, 12 points, sorry, in 13th place. Um, so he is 10 points behind his teammate, Yuki Sonoda. Similarly to Yuki, he has had some DNFs with reliability issues. Um, of course, he's been subject uh, and the victim of the poor strategy calls, uh, Hungary being probably the biggest um, of uh rb's blunders so yeah both drivers could have scored more points um but ricardo i've got it wrong once again i'm three positions currently um out at this midpoint of the season um but let's see if he let's see with him missing out on sergio perez's seat which i think he and many others thought were wrapped up and he had secured supposedly it was a it was a last minute change for um for, for christian horner and helmet marco and so forth to, to keep sergio perez and let's see if he responds to that in the second half of this season i'm intrigued because it could be quite easy to get demoralized you've thought you had that seat in the bag you could be joining the top team again and then it snapped away from you at the last minute now arguably and there's a lot of critics of Daniel Ricciardo out there will say that he hasn't done enough to warrant that second seat. I agree in normal circumstances. However, Sergio Perez hasn't been performing anywhere near <laughs> to the standard of what we'd expect from a second driver in a top team. Um, so I think Daniel Ricciardo or Yuki Tsunoda would do a much better job. Personally, Yuki in that seat. But uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Let's see how he responds. Is he going to just be down in the dumps over it? And is his performance is going to slump? Or is he still like, there's an opportunity here for me. I'm going to make sure I prove everyone wrong and goes out there and, and has a brilliant second half of this season. Uh, I'm intrigued by that. Of course, he could still finish 10th. It's, it's close there between 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th. There's... Uh, only 12 points separating Lance Stroll to Daniel Ricciardo. And we know that Nico Hulkenberg and Yuki are both two points behind Lance Stroll. So P10 still on the cards. P10 is still uh, an a possibility, guys. In P9, Fernando Alonso. And I've got this bang on. Absolutely bang on at this midpoint of the season. Because Fernando Alonso is on 49 points and 25 points ahead of Lance Stroll. So between 9th and 10th, I mean... I know I said Lance Stroll has um, had a, a few performances where he's out-qualified Fernando Alonso and, and finished ahead of him. But when he has done, it's only been for minimal gains. It's only been for P9 and P10, as an example. So whereas Alonso has snuck in a couple of P6s and P7s and gained more points. But it hasn't been a good first half of the season for Fernando Alonso. It really hasn't. Uh, I think he's massively underperformed. Um, he has been unusually quiet over the radio. Normally when he's in a car that's underperforming, which I think the Aston Martin is, so I think there's a combination there. Um, we see Fernando Alonso drop off in performance quite a bit um, because he's sulking and he goes on the radio and he has a go and, and we've seen team morale just completely collapse uh, with this man in the driving seat at teams um but i think it's different this time around he's at the latter eight he's, he knows this is his last drive in f1 um he's it was his birthday the other day and he's 42 43 now um so but he's still one of the, he still is possibly one of the best drivers out there um and very well regarded but he has after i think an okay start to the season he has dropped off he's had some he's had a couple of uh drives where he's not even made it out of q1 in quali or struggled to get out of q2 um he's finished outside the points and been beaten by his teammate quite comfortably in a few races which we wouldn't have seen from fernando alonso last year so um let's Let's see how that develops over the remainder of the season. I still think just because of where Aston Martin is, he's and the top four teams are that much quicker than Aston Martin. Um, I think 
Ninth is where he's going to finish. I think uh, that's one that I think we could quite comfortably um, agree on. But yeah, he's... He, it's not the Fernando Alonso that we know. And I think he's been quite fortunate that with Sergio Perez and other high-profile drivers not having as good a drives or performances in the first half of the season, I think he's been lucky to get away with um, a lot of criticism, really. But maybe that's because of the age that he is and because the car's not as quick as the top four. But um, you'd still expect him to, to wipe the floor of Lance Stroll and and of those other teams you'd expect him in most races to kind of be in no man's land wouldn't you really with his driver ability in that car that is yes quicker than the rest of the midfield but not quick enough than everyone else um so yeah let's see how it gets on and let's see if we end up having um <laughs> a similar uh, a similar like falling apart of the team with him but i doubt that's going to happen because he knows it's his last it's his last season. Well, not last season, his last drive in F1. MPA. Now, this is the one that I've got so, so wrong. <laughs> the one that I've got wrong is Lando Norris in P8. What, guys, what can I say? I just didn't expect McLaren to be quick. I didn't. I. This primarily comes from the fact that I did not think McLaren were going to be as quick as they are how how happy i am to be this wrong because it's great to see mclaren basically being now the front running team in every race um, of course we know how they've balls up their strategy calls and, and they now need to think like a team like that but yeah uh, i had Lando Nor norris eighth because i just didn't see mclaren being quicker over the course of the season then ferrari then mercedes and red bull uh, i thought it'd be close but i didn't think it i didn't think he'd finish in the top three let alone be second currently in the standings on 177 uh, uh sorry 199 points compared to max's 277 at the top um but look lando norris he could be leading this world drivers championship now i genuinely think that or at least less than a race win in difference uh points wise to max verstappen because he has got to the front of the grid he's now in a race winning car but his starts have been dramatically poor unbelievably poor yes supposedly there was a mechanical issue with the um the gearing or the shift shifting through uh at the start of the race who so was bogging down but spa he made a driver error um, he got off to start slow at Barcelona and made made an error in in fighting Max potentially too hard down there and allowed George Russell to swoop round both of them, uh, losing two positions rather than one. Uh, also, uh, China as well, where that sprint race he held onto that position round the outside and let Lewis Hamilton go through and he lost like seven positions rather than uh, just the one and then potentially eventually winning that race and, and and he's just made a lot of driver errors um then we'd i think we'd expect from lando but it is his first time consistently fighting for uh, race wins and pushing for a world championship and look max verstappen has just shown that level of experience that um a multiple world champion has he's been in that uh he's been in the, in this uh position a number of times already and lando has it and i'm sure he'll learn from it and, and i'm intrigued to see uh how he gets on in the remainder of of this season and if he can end with multiple race wins because i think the way mclaren are going at the moment he should i mean already at this point in the season he should have like minimum five race wins and I don't think that's a stretch to say that. Um, the fact of it, he's only got one and Lewis Hamilton has two, has more race wins in Lando Norris' season already is crazy, absolutely crazy. And the worrying thing for Lando Norris is that this man is coming into his own. And I still am backing Oscar Piastri to finish ahead of Lando Norris by the end of the season now he's not in that position at the moment he's currently in p4 
and um, he's 22 points behind Lando Norris. But, wow, like this guy has just got better and better and better. Um, he arguably could have won Silverstone if it wasn't for poor strategy by his team. Um, he was in control of Hungary until that terrible call uh, and balls up by McLaren. And then obviously he won. Um, <clears throat> he uh, he won the race, of course, but then um, he could have won Spa as well. Could have won Spa as well. Um, and just the weakness of Oscar Piastri, which was tire management has seemed to i say disappeared but we've seen two races back to back in spa and hungary which are very hard on the tires notoriously you have to um to do well there you have to be good in tire management and he's done well and excelled in both of those races um, and that's a worry for, for lando norris who is going through a rut at the moment and probably needs this summer break to recharge the batteries and, and to freshen his mind and come back strong because he was getting down a lot, Lando. Very punishing himself a lot and, and very visibly very down in post-race interviews. And Oscar is just quietly going about his business, isn't he? And he's getting better and he's getting better. He's closing that gap on Norris and... He's quick over a single lap as well. He's got the race craft. Lando, who has ended, started this year and has been obviously the, the, the driver to, to be as close to Max, um, a lot closer to Max than we've had anyone in, in the last few years. But that could quite quickly sh switch on its head uh, and Piastri could be finishing ahead of Lando at the end of the year. And I still think and predict he will. Um, so not not um, not quite a good prediction that the mid midway part of this season in regards to the McLaren team uh, because I thought they'd be the full fastest car. Pleasantly surprised and happy that they aren't the full fastest car. And at the moment, Lando is ahead of his teammates, um, split by a certain Ferrari driver. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm still confident about this prediction of. Piastri finishing ahead of Norris, just not where they're going to finish here in 7th and 8th. <laughs> Sixth place, Sergio Perez. I'm close. I'm close, guys. I, Sergio Perez is currently 7th, and I had him in 6th. Um, now, he's only just got to 7th because George Russell's race win was taken away from him. So if George Russell had won that race, then... Um, he would be ahead but of course he didn't and um, rules are rules but look Sergio Perez just the fact of it even before the start of this season I had him in sixth in a car that we all thought would dominate like it has done in the last two seasons and it did start off dominating as well um, because Sergio picked up a couple of one twos didn't he with Max the fact of that I still had him in sixth just shows how little faith I have in Sergio Perez in that Red Bull car. Um, and look, I've, I think I've been proven right. Is there much to say? He's been retained at Red Bull because of monetary reasons, financial reasons, not because of performance reasons. Simple as. I've said a lot about Sergio Perez already. Um, I had him in sixth. I'm not far off the mark. Um, and yeah. Will he get any stronger by the end of the season? I don't think so. I think I think Mexico could be his last race as a Red Bull driver. I think they're literally going to keep him till Mexico, and then they'll they may get rid of him. Maybe they'll keep him on to the end of the season, and he'll be a lucky boy to do so. Uh, but yeah, maybe for that American swing because he's quite popular in America as well, Sergio Perez. So, but the thing is, is that. As I'm saying these things out loud, I'm not saying this because he's a good, like he's is a good driver. Don't get me wrong, but he's just not worthy of being in that second seat alongside Max Verstappen, is he? Um, when you've got other drivers waiting in the wings who who deserve that opportunity more so than him, and when other drivers have been let go for 
not not as badly performing as Sergio Perez has in a more dominant car as well. So yeah, every reason for, I just spout off and eventually try and justify why they're going to keep him is because of financial reasons, not because of driving reasons. So yeah, P6, he's currently in P7. We know how bad of a first half of the season it's been. Very fortunate to still have his seat. And um, yeah, who knows how long he's got left in Red Bull. P5, I'm one away again here. I'm one away again. Uh, Lewis Hamilton is currently in P6 at this halfway point of the season. And look, I was one of those that I I can't remember if I made these before these predictions before the announcement of Lewis joining Ferrari um, or if it was afterwards. I think it was after. But I, I, I didn't have much high hopes for Mercedes. I, I thought they would be quicker than McLaren. I didn't see McLaren making the big strides that they did. And I thought that Mercedes would be... I really thought it would be Ferrari taking it to Red Bull this year. I really think so. Um, and it kind of was at the start of the season. And I thought Mercedes for the for the whole season would kind of be just off the pace of the top two. J just just off of it a bit. And maybe they'd be able to sneak a race win here, here or there. I didn't think we'd be coming into this summer break off the last three races with two Lewis Hamilton wins and him being on the podium um, in between that. Like, like, wow. Unbelievable drives from Lewis Hamilton in both races, of course. George Russell uh, stayed out long and did that one stop and got DQ'd. But Lewis was, oh, no wonder he was so angry and, and frustrated and upset um, after that race because he'd done everything. There was a typical, brilliant Lewis Hamilton drive in regards to tyre management and just doing what he needed to do to get the job done. And then, of course, we know how great a drive that was at Silverstone, his first race win since 2021. Um, but, of course, Mercedes, I still think, need specific conditions to, to win races. Um, they were by, by far uh, not the quickest car at Silverstone and Spa. But what they have done and what Lewis Hamilton has done is that Mercedes have shown that if the conditions are right, they have the strategy team um, to make the correct decisions and they have the drivers, particularly in the form of Lewis Hamilton, to get results when they're not even the fastest car. And uh, McLaren should definitely be looking at how Lewis Hamilton has just won the last two out of the three races because uh, that's a perfect example of how, how they should be performing. Um, so, yeah, I still don't expect Lewis to finish any higher than fifth. I still don't think Mercedes have made the leaps and bounds up the grid as what people expect they have done. I think the results have flattered them, to be honest. And as we said, they need much cooler conditions. They need specific conditions where there's high tire deg, there's uh, increment weather, it's cooler. Um, and that's where someone like Lewis Hamilton's experience can shine through. Uh, and it, it just nullifies the pace advantage that McLaren and uh, Red Bull have at those circuits. So look, Will we see more Lewis Hamilton wins by the end of the season? I wouldn't put it past him because I think we will go to uh, many a circuit between now and the end of the season where we'll see those conditions arise again. Um, but yeah, I don't see him finishing really any higher than where he currently is. Uh, maybe, maybe he'll sneak into the top four if the likes of um, the Ferraris drop back because they're not having a great end to the first half of the season. But um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm happy with that prediction thus far. P4, I had George Russell. And I remember now, I did make this prediction after, and these predictions after the Ferrari uh, announcement of Lewis Hamilton. And the reason I had him in P4 was, as previously mentioned, I thought Mercedes would be slightly quicker, but would be quicker than McLaren, but not as fast as Ferrari and Red Bull. And I thought with Lewis on his way out, I thought we would see a drop-off in performance from Lewis, as I've mentioned previously, quiet quitting or just the fact that even though you have the best intentions, whenever you've handed in your notice at any job, you never perform to the best of your ability. You're never at peak performance once you've handed in your notice. And that's basically what Lewis Hamilton is on. He's on his year's notice. <laughs> and I thought 
with some favorable strategy decisions, uh, probably going towards George because he is going to be that number one driver next year. Um, and um, yeah, I thought he'd finish above him. And for a while, he was ahead of Lewis. And then Lewis has had those a great run of form at the end of the season where he's uh, trounced George, really, of course. George did tremendously with that one-stop strategy, but the calculations of Mercedes meant really that that one-stop wasn't viable or George couldn't defend or shouldn't have defended from Lewis at the end there um, because he took too much out of his tyres uh, and thus uh, resulted in being underweight uh, and supposedly some some uh, um, more flank wear than was initially predicted also from what I've seen in post-race analysis from, from actually the Mercedes team. Um, but yeah, I I still wouldn't be surprised if George goes on a run of form and finishes ahead of Lewis. Um, but we know what Lewis is like once he's got a few wins under his belt. He, he He's a very determined man. Um, and look... Will he finish fourth? I don't think he'll finish fourth. I think he'll finish further down now. Um, but yeah, I, I I still stand by that initial prediction of why he would finish ahead of Lewis. And I didn't see Lewis winning two races and going on the run of form, but he's, he's gone on. Not because I don't have faith in him, but because of the car. Didn't see Mercedes making... Um, as much development gains as they have done while still not being the fastest car of course but as you said they've got an opportunity now when the conditions are right for them to win and they never had that prior so but george in himself performance wise has actually done i think a good job this year uh, he was very unlucky at silverstone of course his home circuit for that engine blowout but george's performance this year have have been great i think he's done really well uh, and he's a bit further down the standings than he should be really of course canada was a race win that potentially was his uh stuck it on pole uh, and then of course he was in the right place at the right time to reap the rewards at austria and get his race win there and of course he's just had 20 25 points removed from him uh for that dq at spa and regardless of what happens it was still a good drive from him nonetheless to to, to win uh mercedes of course should have should have reined him in but look to even if he'd finished on the podium, which he probably would have done, um, if he just backed off and saved those tyres some more. I think it's been good for George Russell, and I think he's a bit harsh to be in eighth place at the moment in the current standings. But yeah, I think if Lewis continues the form that he's on, I don't think George is going to finish ahead of him. But um, George can be proud of uh, of what he's done in the first half of this season, I think. And look, out-qualified Lewis quite comfortably uh through the course of this season although lewis is now coming back into a bit of form um that is now a little bit more even isn't it uh in the last few races at least uh but yeah p4 george russell and i do expect that to change <laughs> further down for the remainder of this season or by the end in third i had carlos signs wow i said i thought ferrari would be the biggest challengers to max and red bull and they were at the start weren't they they were however they've just tailed off the, the development has just tailed off and the other teams have just made more gains than them they brought big upgrade packages um to spain and they've been in limbo since they've been taking going back to old specs mixing them up um and they don't kind of know whether they're coming or going um so we'll see if they can sort that out in the second half of this season but carlos science well started off the year very well very well and i do think he was much better than charles leclerc of course missed that race in uh, saudi arabia due to having his appendix removed and he was in the top three i think it was for the first three or four races he won australia as well um and yeah started off this year very strong um, but then has tailed off he's he's tailed off since then and charles leclerc has comfortably outperformed him um but he's still done a job still done a job and very harsh to be obviously making way for lewis hamilton we all know why of course he's leaving ferrari but still a very harsh decision and he should be in a top team in my opinion and while it's great for williams that they've secured his services for next year um yeah it's 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 not ideal for carlos science because he should be 
fighting for race wins and can consistently get podiums when he is uh, in a top car. And that is, look, while he's not officially a number two driver, Charles Leclerc is the number one driver and Carlos Sainz does what a good number two driver should do. Um, while, of course, he doesn't see himself as a number two driver, he kind of is. And he gets those podiums, he gets those race wins, and he, he reaps the rewards from when Charles Leclerc doesn't perform. Um, and he's always getting into like Q3. You never really see him make a mistake in, in qualifying unless it's a strategy decision by, by Ferrari. Um, so yeah, a good first half of the season to Carlos Sainz. He's currently in P5. Look, it's close up there. He's only five points away from Oscar Piastri in P4. And he's 15 points away from his teammate, uh, Charles Leclerc. So I... I think he still could finish P3. I don't think he will. I think because the two McLarens are going to keep improving and getting better. Um, but yeah, a top five position, a top five result for Carlos Sainz his last season at Ferrari would still be amazing for him. And I think that's still a possibility. I know, I know. I did this for a bit of fun because everyone was putting Max Verstappen as their winner for uh, this season. And... I still had that in my mind as well. That's the logical decision. However, I don't know. For a bit of fun, I thought, oh, he might finish second. I think Red Bull are going to have some more issues this year. Some, surely they can't go a whole year, another year with no reliability issues, which actually they haven't done because they have had some reliability issues. Um, but yeah, look, even, even when now the car isn't the fastest, you're seeing the driver make the difference. Imola was a great example of that canada was a great example of that and he has just dug deep when that car hasn't well has i would say has been the quickest but maybe not that just the, the outright domination like he's had to dig deep and work for it he's been chased by lando and he's managed the race in a certain way but you'd expect from a champion and from a driver of his experience and talent and that's what he's done that's why he's currently leading by 80 something points over Lando Norris and while he's just he's gained that advantage at the start of the season but now he's gonna uh, barring something dramatic with Verstappen crashing out or having some poor reliability um is gonna win this championship quite comfortably um and it's interesting that kind of the drop off in performance has been quite sudden there's rumors of course strong rumors that red bull have been nerfed um we don't know the reasons for that fia fia have history of not announcing um when they've nerfed teams most famously ferrari there were strong rumors about that back in 2017 um and they said nothing of the sort and then it's only a few years later but it came out actually they did tell them to change it and uh, there was a big fine an undisclosed fine to ferrari wouldn't surprise me if something has happened this time around with red bull uh, something internal that we don't can't see and don't know about and the other teams don't know about because the drop-off has been quite severe but max has still dug deep and he's still got the results and that's why he is most likely going to be a four-time world champion so i put in p2 behind Charles Leclerc because I had faith that Ferrari were finally going to challenge for a World Drivers' Championship. But it looked like it at some point, didn't it? It looked like it after Monaco. It did. In Monaco, it really looked like it. Oh, he's only just a race win behind Max Verstappen. Something around 26, 27 points behind. And there was real talk of them. Ferrari be the ones to win the constructors. And... and Charles can catch up to Max. He can be within a race win of Max Verstappen. And then Charles went on probably the worst run of form he's had in many a year. Not particularly due to himself, but due to Ferrari. Just having reliability issues, putting him out on slicks when he should be on wets. And oh my God, um, he went about three or four races after being so close within a race win behind Max Verstappen to then being three race four race wins behind him because he went four races something silly like that with no points it was unbe an unbelievable bad runner form for charles and and i have seen people say that 
Charles must have um, must have gone to a seance or a witch or something and traded in um, this season for that Monaco win that uh, obviously has been so elusive. And look, what a highlight it was for Charles Leclerc. The most boring race in F1 history, but what a highlight it was for Charles Leclerc. Um, and yeah, uh, he has stepped up again. When, they, when he's had the car and the reliability underneath him, he has done well, but Ferrari as a whole have just dropped off and I really thought they were going to be able to take it to Red Bull this year. And they did for a short sustained period, but yeah. They've uh, they've fallen off. Even even as Red Bull have come back to the pack, it's McLaren taking it to them, and not Ferrari. So yeah, let's see what it has. What um, Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz have in store for us in the second half of the season. A lot of it is solely reliant on the team and the car underneath them, not necessarily the drivers. But yeah, Charles was first because I had faith, guys. I had faith, but uh, clearly that faith was misplaced. <laughs> <laughs> not too bad really um halfway through this season with my predictions of course this is the end of season predictions but um yeah some of them are quite well placed some of them aren't uh, more so at the top of the standings <laughs> uh we'll review them come the end uh we still have 10 11 races remaining of this long 2024 season uh, i do think max is going to win uh, i think the gap will get closer if lando can sort out his race starts and come back strong after the uh, summer break but of course oscar piastri is going to be there as well to probably take points off of lando norris i do expect uh, both norris and piastri to be bumped to be multiple race winners between now and the end of the season um but yeah it's i'm just look overall my summary of this midpoint of the season is just how good is it to go into every single race weekend right now and not know who is going to be on the podium who's going to be winning the race um we, we kind of get into the point where we think mclaren will be on the podium but we can't pinpoint whether it will be outright them being the fastest even so is it going to be piastri or norris who will be fastest um is max verstappen's red bull gonna struggle can he dig deep once again i think he's gonna have to dig deep for the remainder of the season in every race to to win um but yeah i mean at the start of the season we all wrote every team off i put charles as number one as a bit of fun as, an, as a bit of faith we all thought max verstappen could win every single race throughout um, and he hasn't He's, we've just gone four races without a match for stap and win without hearing the dutch anthem <laughs> um but yeah f1's in a great place right now bit of a shame that we don't have that world championship fight on the line but it's great going into race weekends not knowing who's going to win um and i'm thoroughly enjoying f1 at the moment the constructors is still up for grabs especially with Red Bull retaining Sergio Perez. So we've still got that to kind of hold on to and look forward to and keep an eye out on. But there's still plenty of stories and um, positions to keep an eye out on um, in the standings. Who will finish in the top 10? Uh, of course, the RB drivers of Ricardo and Yuki, no doubt, still iron for that second Red Bull seat. And uh, of course, uh, the story with McLaren and Lewis Hamilton's resurgence and oh it's just so good at the moment and i'm hoping this continues in the second half of the season and of course into 2025 when um the grid shakes up quite considerably but yeah um let me know what your predictions were at the start of this season how are they getting on uh let me know what you think in the comments below and uh yeah what do you have predicted for the remainder of this season i'm intrigued to hear your thoughts but uh yeah everyone's in a good place right now i'm loving bringing the f1 content to you i cannot wait for the dutch grand prix in a few weeks time uh, as we come back off the summer break and uh yeah i just look forward to every race weekend now so hope you guys do too hit that like and subscribe button turn those notifications on and we'll see you for the next one bye